Hey everybody, my name is Samantha and I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Washington studying ecology, evolution, and conservation biology, as well as marine biology. That's a lot of biologies. It's clear that I'm a biology nerd, but aside from that fact, I think another huge part of my personality that makes me me is that I love EDM. Like, yeah, electronic dance music. <laughs> What I mean to get at is that hearing is a really important sense to me personally for the reasons of listening to music. But one thing that I never considered is how the science biology side of me and my music lover sides of me would interact, especially coming to college. What I mean is that until about a week ago, I had the life altering question come knocking at my door. Or should I say shower curtain? Can fish hear? Like can they? So this has to be a huge question on people's minds nowadays. So yeah, like, how do fish? Okay, I realize that I do not care what other people's opinions are of this topic because I feel personally very passionate about it. I hope I will convince you that it's something you should be passionate about too because we need to ask the question, what would happen theoretically if we let a fish go to an underwater rave? Tell me, I don't know, we'll find out. So the short answer to can fish here is that yeah, they totally can. But before we jump into the how, let's talk a little bit about why. So why would a fish, or any other organism for that matter, benefit from the sense of hearing? Well, to give you some ideas, think about the reasons why we benefit as humans from the sense of hearing. Hearing is the sense that lets you know that you should probably pull your car over to the side of the road when you hear an ambulance coming, because number one, you don't want to cause more of a scene, and number two, you don't want to get run over by an ambulance, because that is just sad and ironic. It's the same sense that also let you know as a kid that there was ice cream in the vicinity and that you should probably run outside and go get some. Hearing is a sense, like many other senses, that gathers information. And this is information about the environment and your surroundings, as well as information about your food or prey, and especially information about how to avoid becoming food for something else. In an aquatic environment where your medium of sound is actually through water, Sometimes sound can be way more efficient in terms of information gathering compared to sight or smell, for example. Sound actually maintains directionality and travels faster and farther than most other stimuli inside of the water. The one other exception to this is maybe light, but even in water, light gets absorbed really quickly or completely depending on how deep you are in the water column. That leads into my final point that sound can overcome physical barriers or obstacles that other stimuli cannot. You now know that sound is actually a really important information gathering tool, and this is going to vary depending on the organism and ecosystem that you're looking at, so in this video we'll explore more about how life history may influence or is influencing an organism's reliance on hearing as a sense. So with that said, let's Let's go ahead and start looking at how fish actually hear. This right here is the inside peak of a modern fish's inner ear. These big loops are called semicircular canals, which aid in orientation and direction awareness. And there are three main regions at the bases of these large loops that have sacs called macula. Each macula is lined with cilia or sensory hairs as part of the sensory epithelium. And each macula also holds a critical component of this whole hearing apparatus called an otolith. You might have heard of otoliths in the past, mainly because otoliths have been used extensively for research all across the board in marine science, from ocean chemistry research to evolution and systematics research to aging specimens that people collect. And the funny thing is that there is so much more literature about how otoliths aid in these areas of research versus the tiny, minuscule amount of actual literature accessible to the public about how otoliths actually work. So I'm here to fill that gap. Otoliths are made out of incredibly dense material, which can vary depending on the species you're looking at, but usually it's made out of calcium carbonate with otolin that's layered on over time. These materials are much more dense than the rest of the fish's body, and because of this density difference, otoliths have a different vibration rate than the rest of the body. It lags as the body experiences vibrations, sounds, and movement. When otoliths move, they disturb the hairs of the sensory epithelium within the inner ear, and these hairs lie in a specific direction naturally. When these hairs are moved in the opposing direction of their natural state, it sends signals to the brain, which then allows the brain to interpret this signal as sound. To conceptualize what density differences mean for hearing, let's have you picture how different parts of your body may react to different frequencies and volumes. So imagine you're at a concert, somehow you're in the front row after fighting your way through the crowd, and now the show begins. 
When the music plays, you can actually feel a rumble in your chest and stomach from the really bass heavy low frequency music. You might even feel some pressure and air coming from the speaker that's not too far from you. It's passing over the hairs of your arm and you can feel a little bit of a tickle. In fish, the tissues of differing densities in comparison to the otoliths are kind of similar to how you might feel with the rumbles and internal movements when experiencing sound at a concert, for example. And quite frankly, this is probably the closest analogy I could think of for how that experience might feel like with interpreting sound with just vibrations and internal movement. Scientists have concluded that most fishes respond to and react to sounds that are 100 hertz up to 500 or even 1000 hertz. These numbers might not make a ton of sense to you right now, so let's listen to a few of those frequencies that humans are definitely able to hear. Depending on your age, you may have been able to hear a little bit further into the high and low extremes of that frequency spectrum, but don't worry, you're about to get one-upped by some fish. Because the range that I told you at the beginning of this segment, from 100 hertz to 500 or 1000 hertz, is for hearing generalists. So this is the average of all of the fishes that exist that have been studied. However, there are some special cases of fishes hearing way beyond this range, like up into the ultrasonic, which are extremely high frequencies, to the infrasonic, which are extremely low frequencies. So here is a demo again with some pinpoints of which sounds fishes can hear. So you might have noticed that literally you might not be able to hear anything at all, unless you have amazing ears, literally putting the speaker of your device to your ear hole or chest right now, or just you're lying, you're lying. Evolutionarily speaking, there's probably a really good reason why we don't have the ability to listen to these extremely high and extremely low frequency sounds. But for fishes, there are tons of reasons why, like we mentioned before, this would be advantageous. Since you now know all of the basic components of hearing and fish hearing systems, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the special cases and the special adaptations and species that I think are just pretty cool. On the topic of fishes that can hear extremely high into these frequency spectrums, let's go ahead and talk about the Clupeidae family of fishes. The members of the Clupeidae family, which include fishes like herring, sardines, and shads, and things like that, are actually able to hear into the thousands of hertz. Again, we have to think about the environment, and literally what I just mentioned in the last section, about what's out to get them, what are they actually going after in terms of prey items, and also what exists in their current soundscape. On the screen are some of the sounds that are produced by certain animals and things within their environment that they might need to take into consideration. So based on what you know about these types of fishes and what currently exists in their soundscape, try and make some predictions about why it would be advantageous for fishes to have such a high frequency recognition system. These fishes have been observed to have extremely long epithelial sensory hairs within the inside of the inner ear. There's possibly a link between the length of sensory epithelium hairs within the inner ear and the ability to hear into these extremely high ranges, but I'll let you be the judge of this when we talk Talk about our next case. With this next case, I'm going to circle back to more of the inner ear morphology conversations we were having earlier, because this family of Melamphidae fishes from the deep sea have the weirdest otoliths I've ever seen. These fishes were weird enough that I paid them a visit at the Burke Museum's ichthyology collection, because I was thinking weird otoliths means weird fish, right? Yeah, I was right. Now, these are some of the sagittal otoliths of other species, and then this is one from a Melamphidae. So why? Remember that otoliths disrupt sensory epithelium in the macula of the inner ear. So having these distinct shapes transforms the way an otolith is actually able to move over the hairs in the macula. For the sake of conceptualization, pretend you're going sled shopping. Sled number one is basically an upside down trash can lid, and sled number two is a super fancy sled you got from Costco that has clean ridges, clean bends, it has a rudder in the back for crying out loud, and it's able to move really good in one particular direction, forward, because good luck trying to move that sled side to side. These sleds are going to move differently over snow, the same way that otoliths of different shapes are going to move over the hairs of the macula differently. The cool thing is, is that Melamphidae fishes have no data on them on their hearing ranges or hearing reception or sensitivity, and they also happen to have extremely long epithelial sensory hairs inside their maculas as well. So what is happening? It's clear that the Melamphidae family has a lot going on for them, and as research is still trying to answer all these questions, I 
highly encourage you to make some predictions of your own. How can the shape of this otolith influence hearing and how can having these really long epithelial hairs like we saw in the Clupeidae and Melamphidae families impact hearing as well? So far we've just been talking about inner ear morphology and how that's influencing hearing. But now we want to talk about some of the things that seem pretty much detached from the hearing system that still help with interpreting sound. I'll call these our fish hearing aids. And the very first one is actually the swim bladder. You heard me folks, the organ that is responsible for controlling buoyancy and controlling a fish's vertical position in the water column happens to be an amazing amplifier. Think about standing next to a drum, for example, in a giant concert hall, and have your friend play their favorite Taylor Swift song and put their phone against that drum. You're gonna hear that sound reverberate through the drum and get louder and louder before it hits your ears. Fishes have been recorded to hear with heightened sensitivity when they have inflated or intact swim bladders, versus fishes that may have deflated or damaged swim bladders. And there's actually fishes out there that have lost their swim bladders over the course of evolutionary history. And many of these fishes, like flatfishes and soles, are used in these experiments and studies related to the general benefit of having a gas-filled space, even if it's artificial. Again, this is a conversation about life history because these benthic-oriented organisms lost their swim bladders because they just didn't have a need to control their buoyancy and vertical position if they're gonna be in the same vertical position for their entire life. Lives. So obviously there's some benefits and drawbacks to these different evolutionary trade-offs. You might question if hearing is even an important sense for these flatfishes, and if so, how are they compensating? And in relation to the swim bladder, the next special case are actually cases of swim bladders extending to touch the inner ear system via two different ways. For example, some fishes have elongated swim bladders that actually touch the back of the inner ear, called an otophysic connection. Members of the otocephalaclade, like our herrings that we mentioned in the first example of special cases, actually have this connection. And some fishes actually have bony ossicles that build a bridge between the swim bladder and the inner ear, like the Weberian apparatus. And the fishes that have these Weberian apparatuses are fishes like carps, tetras, catfishes, piranhas, knifefishes, all primarily freshwater fishes. Considering their environment, which might be sediment or particulate heavy at times, having really good hearing may be able to compensate for the loss of use of other senses in this kind of environment, like vision for example. The final special case is actually something that's present in most fishes to begin with, and it's the lateral line. Remember the concert analogy and the fact that you could literally feel the speaker generating that pressure in air that grazes upon the hairs on your arm? That's the lateral line right there. Pretty much anything that is lower on the frequency spectrum of 200 hertz or less is going to be detected primarily through the lateral line. And this is pretty important for things like detecting water movement or detecting fish movement around you. While the lateral line isn't necessarily immediately connected to sound interpretation, it does help to bridge the gap between mechanoreception of sounds and frequencies and pressure for the fish's entire body. And again, we're going back to that life history conversation. The lateral line can be on a different part of the fish's body depending on its lifestyle. If you're more benthic oriented, you need to figure out what's going on above you. You may have a more dorsally placed lateral line. Whereas if you are more surface oriented, you might need to figure out what's below you. So you're gonna have eventually placed lateral line. Now you're aware of the systems that are responsible for detecting certain types of stimuli. In this case, it depends on frequency and proximity. We have now officially covered everything from the basics to the bizarre of fish hearing. So you actually have all the tools you need to answer the age old question, what would happen if you threw an underwater rave for a fish? You know how the properties of water actually impact how sound moves through water. You also know the frequencies that some fishes can hear and the adaptations that some fishes may have to make the experience of a rave even better. And as an added bonus, you also know about some of the other sensory capabilities in fishes that allow them to detect vibrations and pressure in general. So if if you're at all curious about any of the materials or case studies presented in this video, I've compiled everything into a lovely document at the link below, and you can actually try out some of these questions that are related to fish hearing and test out some of the skills scientists definitely need. You'll learn how to read scientific figures from scientific articles, you'll also learn how to create hypotheses and how to test them with your own experimental designs. There's a ton of other activities related to the topic of fish hearing included in there as well, so let me know how it goes, I'm curious to see what you all make. Anyways, I just want to thank you all for nerding out about fish with me for the last few minutes, and I hope that I can catch you next time at an EDM concert near you. Bye-bye!